and thanks for joining us for another edition of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me today, as always, are three of our panelists who are here to tell you what's going on in their neck of the woods and also answer some questions that you have sent in. So uh, before we get started, let's have them introduce themselves. Uh, Jen, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. You can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. I like all kinds of different horticulture, but my favorite things to talk about are vegetables and houseplants. Very timely. All right. Thank you very much. And now uh, Marty. Hi, TV land. <laughs> my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a retired landscaper and my least favorite things to talk about are vegetables and houseplants. So <laughs> there you go. I just don't. Yeah. So, all righty. And then John, he's in the middle. He's the rose between two thorns. All right, John. I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a master gardener from uh, Vermaine County and I live by, up by Bismarck, Illinois. And I like just about anything that I can grow. Okay, perfect. Okay. So let's jump right in, John. You've got a show and tell uh, that yeah. you brought, whichever one you want to do first. Go okay, for it. Okay. I am going to do my uh, Annabelle hydrangea. I picked this just a few, just a few minutes ago. And it's, you could see that it's not white anymore like they normally are. But in this stage, if you pick them now, hang them upside down and let them dry, I would take the leaves off and, uh, you know, just pull them off and let them dry like this and pick all of the leaves off so that it doesn't put too much pressure on and let them dry. They'll dry green. And you know, it's, it, they'll stay like this if you don't put them in the sunlight for up to six months. I've, I've made some bouquets in, 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 on the table and, and they've stayed very nice. Now, if you don't like the green or if you wanna have a little bit of change, uh, once they're completely dry, you can take like a, some of the spray paints like, and they, they've come out with some really nice pastel colors. And so you don't have to have red, red, or you can have kind of the Easter pastel colors, the light yellows, the pinks, the light blues and, and whatever that you would prefer, but you can keep them then for forever. So, but. Uh, John, I was going to ask, I think Marty was in the middle of a phone call. <laughs> I was gonna ask, um, well, shoot, I lost my question. Oh, with all of the rain that we've had, with all yes. the rain we've had lately, um, how are your hydrangeas doing? Do hydrangeas like a lot of rain? Do they like a dry spell? And how are yours doing this year? They are doing very well. The only problem is when we get a, a very hard rain, they tend to kind of get, especially the tall ones, will lean over kind of like peonies. And um, so that can be a problem. If, if they are in the, in, on the grass too long or wherever they're, they will cover things up. If that's a problem, you just need to clip them. And hopefully you have enough that are still upright. One way to kind of keep that from happening is in the spring, once they come up, is to trim them to almost to the ground. And then they'll put up new shoots and they'll be a little bit thicker and thin out anything that is really, really thin stem. Because you know, this is pretty big. And if you if like this year, we've had so much rain that it's like peonies. They just. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Or was somebody else? Did you have anything to add to that, guys? Okay. Uh, okay. Panic live ranges don't, they tend to not droop quite as badly as the mop pets because they have a stiffer stem. Yeah. Um, but, but, the, you know, they both have their own charm. So. Awesome. Okay, so now I have a photo that I'd like to share today um, <laughs> of what's going on at my house. I started out with a beautiful garden uh, in the spring <laughs> when we were finally able to plant. And then two, not one, but two families of rabbits have showed up and they have literally destroyed everything. We didn't get any green beans. They snapped the chops off of those. They went to work on my sunflowers. They ate all the strawberries. And so here they are coming up to my patio and eating mm -hmm. out of my herbs. I've got cucamelons there on the bottom, um, but they ate all the garlic. They were on the top working on the chamomile. Um, as you can see, the basil is, is pretty sparse. So um, as a very concerned viewer, guys, I need to know what to do about these rabbits. And all of you right now are smiling so big because I feel like this is not gonna be 
a good answer. <laughs> And I can't be the only one that are, that's going through this. So um, if you guys could each kind of walk through your rabbit control, um, hopefully it doesn't involve, you know, the thing. Um, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, Marty, go ahead. Tell me okay. about the rabbits at your place. No, yes, children. I have a dog uh, and he likes to hunt rabbits and that, Consequently, he's pretty successful at it and they don't they don't survive <clears throat> the hunting trip. But that's okay with me because they eat every kind of chicken So anyway, um yeah. Animal if you have a pet that goes outside, that'll really help. That'll really help. But yeah. other than that, the only thing I've ever found really that helps that really prevents damage is ugh, fences. Just fences. Um you can have they have to the 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 wire or whatever whatever you use has to be small enough that they can't get through it. They'd be surprised. Even the babies, you have to get through the babies use. too. Yeah, yeah, the little ones even. So, um, they're just they're re remarkably resourceful, and it has to be. I found if it, it's not two feet tall or taller, they'll just jump over it. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can try to be as decorative as you possibly can. But uh, gosh, you know, I, I haven't found anything that repels them well enough to not like fence. <laughs> fence right, just, John. There are lots of repellents out there, but most of them are only going to work for maybe a week, maybe two, but then they get accustomed to it there. You know, I've we've hung aluminum pie plates out trying to and they rattle in the wind. Well, that's kept the deer away to a certain degree, but the groundhogs and I put up some fencing, the groundhogs either dig underneath them or, or, or climb over them. The raccoons do the same. Uh, it's, it's, it's mother nature against us. And uh, <laughs> this year I, I'm like, you know, I am, uh, you know, my vegetables, I am losing, uh, you know, to mother nature. Same here. Okay. Jen, what about you? We are kind of suffering the same situation at our house. We've had some luck with a repellent called Repels All, but with mm -hmm. all repellents, I have found it's much more effective if you get the repellent on before they start eating on it. Um, Cause otherwise, like I tried so many things over the years, I tried hot pepper um, sprays and it just seemed like they just kept eating it. I'm like, they must just like the spice, I don't know. but. Um, the repels all is kind of like liquid fence, but it's got some extra ingredients like putrefied meat. It's horrendous smelling um, until it dries. Uh, I've had some luck with that, but like Marty said, the fence, um, especially around things like green beans, um, you can hide, you can hide a fine wire, like a chicken wire fence behind a decorative fence. There's nothing that says you can't do that. And if you bury the bottom few inches um, there and angle it out, they're less likely to tunnel under it. But yeah, it's it's like man versus wild. It really is. This is my uh, first. But cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah, cats and dogs um, can help um, discourage them. If you like, you have a really big dog. Get him out there and maybe leave some of his hair around. Yeah, well, that's the, the thing. They're both getting old. Um, you know, we've got a seven year old St. Bernard, so she's not making tracks quite like she used to, and they know it. Um, yeah. So maybe next year we'll get to enjoy some of those vegetables, but we've we've lost and I've even I'm doing bale gardening. They are up on the bales having the time of their life. Um, we're, yes. Yes. Oh. yes, we and lost. I, I learned. <laughs> Just to, just to add something for the winter time may not be the end of it. We learned um, when we first moved in, I tried to grow blueberries and I couldn't figure in the spring why there was so much damage so far up on the bushes. And I was like, well, deer don't come up in our yard generally. And this looks like rabbit damage. It's wherever the snow was. So uh -huh. they would just right on the snow drift and right. did their they did do little step ladder. Right. Holy That's cow. My tree wrap's important too. Yeah. To wrap yeah, you your mind. Well, yep. I'm not alone. So that makes me feel better. I'm in good company. Because if it's happening to the pros, then I'm not doing too bad. Okay. Uh, John, you've got another. 
Oh, go How ahead, do you feel Mark. about rat snakes? Black snakes or rat snakes, they're very useful for rodent control. And foxes, yeah. I would encourage foxes <laughs> as much as you possibly can. Okay, they're all welcome. They're asking about snakes, but I'll tell you, snakes are where it's at. They eat little stuff all night long. Well, well, they're certainly I, welcome here. So if they would come and help out, <laughs> the more the merrier. Just leave my chickens alone. That's, that's, the only, that's the only thing. So, okay, John, you've got something you brought in about something else folks are probably seeing out in their yards yes. this time of year. Uh, I have a large sycamore, and the sycamores at this time of the year tend to start to defoliate their skin and mm -hmm. their, their bark. And uh, this is what I'm finding. I'm finding all kinds of this. Uh, different sizes, different lengths, uh, and it's just a natural process. Nothing to worry about. And, you know, you could collect them and make little art projects for the kids. You know, they can do different art projects. I, I've seen all kinds of neat art projects done with them, but it's nothing to worry about. It's just the natural process of the tree growing, and it's got to, when it stretches, it it uh, defoliates that top um that top layer of the outer layer of bark. And that's all this is. It's, you know, kind of neat and, you know, except for cleaning it up. One of those things that, you know, you know, they have the, the good, the bad and the ugly. Sycamore is in the good, the bad, or the bad and the ugly. And this is one of the reasons, you know, because it's <laughs> sycamore then it's not. And then it has all these problems besides not being sick. It's, it's got its natural growing habits. So nothing to worry about. Just pick, pick them up and they make good kindling too. I was just going to ask if you could just throw those in the fire pit and use them to uh, start your bonfires to keep going camping or something. They make wonderful kindling. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Uh, now we're going to jump into some questions. Uh, Marty, we're going to start with you. We're going to go to question 35, DJ. Uh, this is from Megan. She writes, I have a peach tree that's about four years old. This is the first year I'm going to have peaches. I just noticed today about a dozen of the leaves on the trees have different looking growths. Not sure what else to call them. Uh, so looks like something attached itself to the leaf. I'm attaching several pictures to this email. Any idea what it could be? Um, and is there something I can do to get rid of it? If it's a bad thing, appreciate any help. So let's check out her pictures that she sent in and mm -hmm. see uh, what you guys think here. Well, we thought peach leaf curl, and then John found a picture of aphid damage that was almost identical. I thought without seeing a picture, it might be gall, which is not typically a big problem. But I would recommend in this situation that she check for aphids, little green. They're, they're tiny. They're really soft, uh, like the head of a pin, maybe. They're, they're either kind of a leafy green or a black. They can also be kind of a reddish. They're a little bug that, that sucks juice out of your leaf and then it makes the leaf curl. But with all the rain we've had, it could be the fungus peach leaf curl. <laughs> so it's been really rainy here in uh, central Illinois area for about a month now. So you might wanna look for both those things. If you don't see, if you, if you see aphids, treat for aphids. Aphids are very easy to eradicate. They're soft bodied, just spraying them with insecticidal soap solution we usually just get rid of them you can try blowing them off with a sharp stream of water i mean just water your tree, just spray it off like you're washing a car um the fungicide for peach leaf curl you're gonna have to you're gonna have to apply that don't worry i saw the fruit on the tree don't worry about that it won't bother your fruit at all and you can wash it off it's usually a like a copper or a sulfur based fungicide it's a natural eradicant. It's a it's a it's a deterrent for the fungus. So um, go to your local garden center. Tell them you got that. But look at your tree first and see if you're if you're dealing with an insect or a fungus. If you see insects, then you've got them. If you don't, you know, then go with the fungus. Try to treat as minimally as possible. Or I always try to treat as minimally as possible. If it's aphids, you may see a sticky substance, and if they've been there for a oh, while. Yeah. You may see a, a black mold because once that sugar starts, you know, they the aphids yeah. kind of can't digest all of the stuff. So they exude it and then it turns into a, what they call a sooty mold, which is a, a black mold. And that will come later. But that's a yeah. sure sign that you have aphids, too. 
Yeah. Forgot about the honeydew. Thank you. I did. Mm -hmm. All right. We are going to Jen. Uh, DJ, this is question number 42. Um, this is from Ethan. He wants to know if his, let me find it here. There we go. I wanted to know if my Coreopsis will overwinter in pots outside. Uh, Jen, what do you, what are your thoughts here? Um, well, my first thought is it's possible with the right insulation on the pots. If he has to leave the pots outside, if they're big enough, they may overwinter as they are. Um, but we don't have any good way of predicting with 100% accuracy what our winter will be like. If he can move them into a garage or a shed or somewhere out of the elements, I think he'd have a better shot at having them overwinter. Um, if not, he can try to put some styrofoam pieces or something to insulate that pot. I would be concerned also about what the pot is made out of because that expansion and contraction of the freezing and thawing cycle, um, if it's a big fancy ceramic pot, you're probably going to destroy the pot. Um, there are some exceptions on the market. There are some, some out there that are frost resistant, uh, but that doesn't mean they're frost proof. Um, so I guess it's kind of like, a, and it depends sort of answer. He's got to really look at what his conditions are like in his yard. I personally, I would try to move it inside if I could. I think that's the best thing is to move it inside or heal them into the garden. You know, you can yeah. heal them, oh, dig them into the ground. Yeah, if they're not the ceramic or use styrofoam. Uh, what do you mean by using styrofoam? Just put it around the pot or? Around the pot. Because what's going to kill the coreopsis is not the temperature above ground. It's it's that freezing and thawing cycle over and over um, the winter time because it's never going to freeze and just stay cold. And that, that, that uh, temperature flux is what will kill the plant. Gotcha. Okay. All right, thank you. We're going to John, uh, question number 55. Uh, this is from Monty Walker, writes in, my lilac bush had very few flower stalks the last few spring seasons, two to seven, seven stalks is all I get. I've had it about 10 years. It gets lots of sun in the spring, part sun and shade the rest of the growing season. Do you think it needs food? No pictures with this one. So, um, you know, not giving a lot of growth. He talked about the light needs. What are your thoughts here about why it's not flowering? I would say, you know, it, it, you know, in the spring, which before the leaves start to form on their trees, yeah, it may be getting some leaves, but the leaves aren't developed yet. And later on during the season, when it's building up next year's flower buds, it, it sounds like it's in, in pretty much shade. So I think that's her biggest problem is that once those, the tree goes through its cycle, of the old flowers, then it starts the new cycle. And by that time, she's in too much shade. And I think, and lilacs want full sun. They just, and as far as fertilizing, if it, if it, if it looks healthy, I don't think I would. Uh, if mm -hmm. it's, you know, 10 years old, she may start to notice some of the older branches, the, the stalks are getting um, barky, you know, the, 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 I, uh, you know, it looks like actual bark rather than smooth skin. Mm -hmm. That's where you can get some um, lilac borers. These are the Japanese silky lilac. So I'm not, I haven't heard that they get the lilac borers quite as bad as the old fashioned lilacs, but I'm sure they probably do. So I would, I would trim those out unless she has the, unless it's the tree, if it's the tree, then she can't obviously do that. But I, I think the biggest thing is the sun. Okay. All right. We're going back to Marty. Number 38. This is from Terry Z. Uh, mm -hmm. Right then, blueberries won't produce after one really close to it was moved. A blue crop that was six feet tall and it's always loaded until I move the one next to it 10 feet away. Any help? So would that affect whether or not the berries produce? I think it would. Uh, uh... Jen or John, if you want to chime in on this, but this is my, this is my take on this. Um, when you have particular varieties, blueberries, first of all, blueberries are self-pollinating, but they'll always do better. Any self-pollinating plant, fruit trees or anything does better if there is another plant to cross-pollinate it. So there are also recommended varieties for, uh, this particular kind of apple or peach or apricot or pear or blueberry, pollinate it with this kind or this kind or this kind, but not this or this or this. 
It's because of the way they bloom. And if they're blooming at the same time, then they can cross pollinate one another. And if one's later and one's earlier, they miss each other's bloom to pollinate one another. Okay, so I think you might want to consider getting another blue crop <laughs> that's smaller, or if you know the variety of the blueberry you have that, that produce so well, and then you move the blue crop away from it. If you know that one, then look up what's the best pollinator for that variety of blueberry. I may um, have you can see. The other thing I was gonna, considering too is that she moved it, and that you know it may take a couple of years for that to recover. It's just like when we transfer or transplant something, it goes through kind of like a transplant shock and it's yes. going to take a while, you know, for it to recover. If she sees flowers on it and lots of flowers and she still doesn't get blueberries, I would go with what you just said. But if it doesn't, it's probably just protecting itself until it gets its roots reestablished. And, uh, and then it should, you know, it could be that it's too far away, but most of the time those pollinators, will we'll transfer, but they, it, like you say too, it's self-pollinating. Jen, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, kind of along the lines of what John was saying, it sounds like if I'm understanding the question correctly, she just moved that blue crop to be, it's still there somewhere, it's just further away from the original plant. So like John said, she she's disturbed that one, the blueberry bush that she moved, but she's also disturbed the roots of the one that remained in place. And so, if this is just the next year, I would give it time because it's got to re it's got to replenish that root system and recover from that um, stress on the roots. Okay, awesome. I'd also be interested to know whether or not the blue crop that she moves, I, she said it was six feet tall. I don't know if they moved it or just removed it. No, I'm not sure. But if they actually moved it to a different location, I'd be interested to know whether or not it gets any fruit on it. And I don't know what time of year they moved it, Maybe they moved it before they even bloomed or something. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure about all the, if she was a caller, <laughs> I'd ask her all these questions, but I can't, I can't answer these questions. So anyway, so there's, well, yeah. Hopefully there's one day, day. hopefully yeah. one day we'll be able to follow up with Terry and see how this all mm -hmm. panned out. That'd all right. Fantastic. Number 62, this will be sort of a group question. John had this one on his list. Um, this is from Jan Eagles in Petersburg. She's got some uh, tomato plants, different varieties. Uh, two of the plants have what she referred to as purple spots or stuff on the leaves. Also, one of the plants has yellow leaves on the lower branches. Can you tell me what the purple stuff is and if it's harmful? They all have tomatoes growing on them and they look good. I've already picked one off the plants and had and it had some splitting on the end. Um, is there any way to avoid that? So two part question. What do you guys think about the foliage and then the splitting on the end? So John, we'll have you start. And then everyone can just sort of jump in on this one. I think it's totally environmental. Um, we've had so much rain and it looks like she's got it mounded there. So that mound probably got drenched and drenched. So purple tells me that there could be a phosphorus deficiency. The lower leaves are yellow. That tells me that she's also got a little bit of fungus problem in there. And that's yeah. with all the moisture, those, those leaves are probably never drying out. So it's, a, I think it's environmental if she just is patient and removes any of those lower yellow leaves and gets rid of them completely. I think the plant will come out of it and be fine. She may want to give it just a little bit of phosphorus, some uh, a, 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 a slow release 10-10-10 um, or something like that, that's going to have more of the phosphorus or 20-20-20. Okay. All right. Jen? Um, I just wanted to add, I've seen that sort of um, reddish tone in plants that are flooded before. Um, it's really common in corn. If you look at uh, fields that are flooded when corn's at a seedling stage, they turn red. Um, so it is a phosphorus deficiency within the plant, but it's totally related to having too much water around. Okay. And Marty, can you talk a little bit about the splitting at the bottom? The splitting... She said in her question that the bottom of the tomatoes were split. Some of them. Oh, were split. Of, you know, she's got blossom end rot and the water issue. I would say you're going to need a, to add a little bit of calcium um, and you can avoid the blossom end rot and then and you can get it as a, as an amendment, as a garden amendment anywhere. Any garden center should carry that. Um, also, if it, the fruit is almost ripe 
and as she gets a rain, it's going to, the, the plant is going to absorb a whole bunch of moisture and put it into the fruit and the fruit can't expand fast enough and it's going to pop like a balloon. So if she can, if she knows she's going to get some rain, if she can go pick the fruit before that, even if it's not completely ripe, just bring it in and let it uh, ripen on the counter. I think she'd, she'd be happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you guys doing out at your house to combat these mosquitoes? You know, we're all outside trying to weed and keep things together. You know, what are you guys doing to not be eaten alive out there? Well, you can... I, I, have, I have the wristbands. I've got the, the head, I've got spray, you know, mosquito <laughs> repellent. Also, if you're out in the most miserable part of the day, they don't like it as well then either. So, you know, but Hey, yeah. I found yeah. dryer sheets yeah. in my hat tend to keep things away. Okay. All right, Jen, what awesome. about you? I was going to say, judging by the looks of my garden, I haven't been out there enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's not I, worth risking it. You're eating alive as soon as you walk out the door. Yep. All right, guys. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing. And thank you so much for watching. Be sure to find us on social media. Just search Mid American Gardener on Instagram and Facebook. And if you've got a question, send it in to yourgarden at gmail.com and one of our experts could answer on an upcoming show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.